So far, we've talked about the x-axis of an NMR spectrum as frequency, the precession frequency of the hydrogen atom in a proton NMR spectrum. But frequencies are not reported directly on NMR spectra, and this is because of dependencies we've already seen. The resonance frequency depends on the magnetic field strength of the instrument, so along with every reported frequency, we'd need the frequency, the operating frequency, or the magnetic field strength of the instrument as well. That's one reason we don't report frequencies directly on NMR spectra. The other has to do with the fact that these differences in frequency due to these electronic you know, sort of countering magnetic fields via electron density are tiny, very tiny relative to the operating frequency. So while your operating frequency might be in megahertz, your differences in frequency due to protons in different chemical environments may be on the order of tens or hundreds of hertz. So very, very tiny differences. For, this re for these reasons, we convert frequency into an instrument-independent measure of frequency known as chemical shift, and this is the x-axis of any NMR spectrum. Chemical shift is the normalized shift in the resonance frequency or precession frequency relative to the standard, which is typically tetramethylsilane, SIMU4. And a mathematical representation of this is, is shown here. So chemical shift is typically represented with a lowercase delta symbol, and it is equal to the, di the change in frequency in going from, say, TMS to our hydrogen of interest, to the change in that frequency, which is going to be on the order of hertz, divided by the operating frequency of the of instrument, which is the precession frequency of tetramethylsilane itself. And because this will typically be in the millions of hertz, and this will typically be in the hertz, the units of chemical shift are parts per million. Hertz divided by megahertz is how you can think about this. Now, we think of chemical shift as being associated with a more positive chemical shift corresponds to greater deshielding and lower electron density. So chemical shift, and again, by convention and for historical reasons, tends to increase from right to left. Notice we have the zero, the standard tetramethylsilane here on the far right, and we have very deshielded protons at high chemical shift, eight, nine, 10, and beyond on the left-hand side. So on the left-hand side, we have these very low electron density um, protons, highly deshielded. This is also referred to as downfield, and this is a throwback to the continuous wave days. And on the right-hand side, we have high electron density protons upfielded, uh, upfield that are relatively shielded. And if you get beyond TMS, these tend to be almost negatively charged hydrogens, and things like metal hydrides will actually show up at negative chemical shifts. Now, in organic compounds, which typically contain electronegative atoms like nitrogen, oxygen, and the halogens, the vast majority of signals will show up at positive chemical shift, and very, very few go beyond 8 ppm. Beyond 8 ppm, you're looking at a very, very electron deficient proton, something in a carboxylic acid or aldehyde functional group, for example. How does structure relate to chemical shift? Well, this slide begins to answer this question. Electronegative atoms tend to increase chemical shift of nearby protons, and this series shows this idea beautifully. We go from methane to methyl iodide, methyl bromide, methyl chloride, methyl fluoride. We're increasing the electronegativity of that atom linked to the methyl group, from hydrogen, lowest electronegativity, to iodine, bromine, chlorine, and fluorine. And as that electronegativity increases, notice the chemical shift goes up. This occurs because the carbon is becoming more and more electron deficient. Here it's got the highest electron density. Here it's in, it might even be actually partially negative. Here it's going to be slightly partially positive. Here it's going to be even more partially positive. Here even more. And of course in methyl fluoride, this carbon has the greatest partial positive charge of all. And so as the carbon becomes more electron deficient, the hydrogens attached become more electron deficient as well. We should point that out. These attached hydrogens are also going to become partially positive. We get a higher chemical shift, indicating more deshielding at these hydrogens nearby the electronegative atoms. As we add multiple electronegative atoms, we get almost an additive effect. So we can see here, for example, going from methane to methyl chloride, we're up to 3.1 ppm. If we add a second chloride, we get 
uh, almost two ppm additional shift downfield. And then if we add a third chloride, we get two more ppm shift downfield. So we can see as we add electronegative atoms, the chemical shift goes up almost in an additive way. This last example shows us that inductive effects fall off with distance. The farther away the hydrogens are from the electronegative atom, the less the effect on chemical shift. So the most downfield, the most shielded hydrogens are these in the methyl group, farthest away from the electronegative chlorine. As we creep closer to that electronegative chlorine, the chemical shift goes up and the protons get more de-shielded. Uh, sorry. These are upfield, not downfield. The most upfield protons, the most shielded, are the CH3. We go a little bit uh, more deshielded here, a little bit downfield, and then the most deshielded are here at 3.3 ppm, closest to the chlorine, showing that inductive effects fall off with distance, and uh, we get the lowest electron density at these hydrogens closest to the electronegative atom. Now, chemical shifts of methyl, CH2, and CH groups in the absence of inductive effects, when these groups are just connected to carbons, are actually pretty similar, regardless of the connectivity of the carbon groups nearby. About 0.9 ppm, 1.2 ppm, and 1.7 ppm. And these numbers aren't exactly worth committing to memory. They're just going to make a point about how we can predict NMR spectra that I'm going to return to in, in a second. The, the changes in chemical shifts due to electronegative groups are also somewhat transferable. So when we tack an oxygen in an alcohol or ether nearby a proton, we get about 2.5 ppm increase in chemical shift. An ester oxygen is worth about 3 ppm because the ester oxygen is actually a bit more electron deficient, a bit more electronegative than uh, an alcohol or ether oxygen. And a carbonyl group itself is worth about 1 a unit, a unit increase in, in ppm, an increase in uh, chemical shift of about one unit. Using these ideas, we can actually pretty reliably calculate NMR spectrum from a molecular structure. And this website, nmrdb.org, is one tool that you can use to do this. You can build in a structure, and it will use a set of rules based on these ideas, kind of standard chemical shifts for CH3, CH2, and CH, and the changes caused by electronegative atoms and various types of functional groups to calculate the spectrum for you. There are some functional groups that give rather odd chemical shifts, and alkenes, alkynes, and aromatics, which contain pi electrons, give some very strange looking results if we're just thinking about electronegativity. Aromatic protons show up typically between 6 and 8 parts per million which makes these look very, very de-shielded, but the carbons of benzene are not particularly electronegative. Likewise, alkene protons tend to show up in the range of about 4 to 6 ppm, and there again, just a carbon-carbon double bond, the carbons aren't super electronegative, so it's unclear what's going on here, what's causing this, this de-shielding, what's causing this low electron density at the hydrogens. The idea is that the pi electrons in alkenes and arenes, such as benzene, actually deshield nearby protons. And, and the way this works has to do with the circulation of electrons that occurs when the compound is put in an external magnetic field. The external magnetic field runs this way. And so the electrons circulate to create a countering magnetic field. But this appears, because the molecule is a ring, this appears in the center of the ring as electrons circulate the pi electrons circulate around the ring. But notice what this does around the vicinity of the hydrogens. That circulating magnetic field actually adds to the magnetic field felt by the hydrogens, which are outside of the ring. This creates a de-shielding effect. And a concise way to talk about it uses this idea of ring current. Circulation of electrons around the ring actually adds to the magnetic field felt by the H's outside of the ring. And a similar thing happens in alkenes and leads to this typical range for alkene protons that looks very de-shielded, very downfield relative to alkyl CH, CH2, CH3 protons. Terminal alkyne protons, as it turns out, are actually shielded by anisotropic effects. And so in a terminal alkyne, we're going to have a carbon-carbon triple bond with an H on the end here, this is actually shielded by anisotropic effects. So if our 
magnetic field is going this way, circulation of the pi electrons associated with the alkyne actually does create a countering magnetic field. And so these will show up, I believe, in the range of 3 to 4, maybe 5 ppm, actually upfield of alkenes. Like the vibrational frequency in infrared spectra, chemical shifts in proton NMR spectra are diagnostic of particular functional groups. And we've already talked about some standard chemical shifts for methyl, methylene, and methyne hydrogens, which you see right here. But other functional groups have pretty typical chemical shifts as well. Allylic hydrogens around 2, alkynyl hydrogens around 2.5, there you go, between 2 and 3 ppm for the alkynyl protons. And then as we connect to electronegative atoms or put electronegative atoms nearby, we get higher chemical shifts. And so we can generate a correlation table or correlation chart for proton NMR spectroscopy that allows us to find a signal in a particular chemical shift range and correlate that with the most likely functional group. And these are pretty typical ranges that are worth committing to memory, but in Chem 2311 will also be provided on exams. The ones that I would commit to memory are the aryl region between 6.5 and, and 8, the alkenal region 4.5 to 6.5, and, and this alkyl region pretty much below 2 is a good one to keep in mind.